Hello. So for, uh, for this lecture today, I dressed myself a bit as I usually do. It's like, I call it like the, the method of the onion. So I do wear like many, many layers. Like, first of all, um, I like my independence. So summer, winter, ready to jump on my bike. Yeah. My autonomy, I think it's something which is really important for me. For example, the shoes. I never wear high heels, like comfortable shoes, always ready to jump a fence. But that I will tell you later. But what is important for today is that I, actually I wear, I wear two jackets. So, uh, hello. Hi. So, so for today, I, I, I've chosen to wear two jackets. I actually, I often do. So this one, it's like, it's my researcher jacket. Because after all, I am a researcher. I do research on research in agriculture, right? And then this one is my, my activist jacket. And so usually I try to wear them both, but that's often it's like hot, and as you can see, it's also a bit tight. So, for example, when I notice that when I bring too much the activist jacket inside the universities, it's not well perceived. Like, after all, as a researcher, you're supposed to be able to work like independent from your context, objective, and definitely not being too engaged. That will mainly, I would say, strengthen the idea of being a troublemaker. But then on other moments, funnily enough, like actually I would like to hide my, my research jacket. For example, I remember a few years ago, it's when I met Rob, uh, I was in a meeting in, uh, in Austria and uh, someone asked me there, what do you do? It's like an activist gathering. Uh, what do you do in life? And I was with a little voice, I'm a researcher. So actually, I felt a kind of like an intruder maybe to be there in the activist gathering because I was thinking maybe the guy, he thinks that I'm here to study him. And that was not the case at that moment, but it could have well been because just before I did a PhD on social movements. So, and, and after all, I think have, in the university, I, I have been trained to, um, yeah, to be the one that knows for the people what's good for them, what's the, the problems they are facing, and, and, and also the, the solutions, right? But yet, I think with the time, the more I have probably become an activist, I also think it's important, or I find it important to reclaim the jacket of the researchers. In the end, I do like research. It's like going deep, read, analysis, build, decorticate, proclaim, explain. So being here in front of you today, it's kind of out of my comfort zone. <laughs> um, it's for many reasons, but um, not only do I always forget my text, so here it is. <laughs> uh, but it's also that I'm telling you a story from my viewpoint, which could be told in, in many different ways, right? In, I tell it from a very privileged position, I'm aware of that as well. And knowing that there are many other ways of seeing it. So why does it make me that uncomfortable? I don't know how it's around here, but in Belgium, like if activists and researchers, they share something. You know what? They're always right. And then there are special cases. It's when the researchers, they actually, they know the answer before they've started doing their research. I'll give you an example. In May 2011, you would find this big billboard next to, uh, next to an experimental uh, field trial. So the University of Ghent, like you can see there, is testing uh, with, together with some partners, like of which uh, BASF, they are testing the uh, potatoes that have been genetically manipulated to become more resistant uh, against blight. And so while doing the experiment, they place this billboard next to it 
and it says, here grow the potatoes of the future, dot. Here grow the potatoes of the future, dot. Not even a question mark, a dot. So to me that, that sounded weird, like researchers even before starting their work, they know the answer. That puts me questions. And then there is something else with researchers. Ostrich-like behavior. Behavior or politics where one does not want to see the negative effects. Continue as it was doing. Ignore the problems around it. So a while ago, a few years ago, I was in, in Den Haag in a, in a conference in uh, the Transnational Institute. Some of you may have been there, actually. It was called Food Sovereignty, a Critical Dialogue. So the idea of that conference was that if we ever would want to move towards something as a people's right to define their food system, we actually would need to radically change also the way we produce and think about knowledge production. So the gathering was a coming together of people from the Acampesina, researchers and NGOs, which are considered the allies, right? And so um, during the workshop at, at, mo uh, at one moment, we were asked to imagine uh, what role we, we thought we would want to play as a social movement in the global governance of food systems. And to, do, to think about that, we were imagining animals and think of an animal, we had to think of an animal that would represent someone in the global food governance uh, system. So, what did I choose? The ostrich. For me, the ostrich, it represented like the the scientific community. So this expression of burying the head in the, in the sand, it comes from the idea that when ostriches, um, they, they, they plunge their head deep into the sand when they're afraid of something. Yeah? So it's like, I think it's a bit like the scientists. They run, they run, they run to chase the progress of science, always faster, no hesitation. But if you ask them like something about what they're really doing, like what's the impact of their work, and want to engage into a discussion um, on that, the answer would be that it's not of my responsibility. And I don't know about how you see this, but I would think that this idea that the progress of the sciences is automatically the progress, uh, societal progress, that what comes out of the laboratories of the university is inevitably good. It remains a widely held belief, but I don't think it, you could still claim that. The idea of progress in the techno sciences is social, societal progress. No other ways? Hmm. Anyway, if I, if I, uh, whoops, I lost my, no, I didn't. So the story of the, of the ostriches, it's actually, it's not true. Huh? So if you want to do justice to the, to the ostriches, why do they put their head in the sand? Yeah. Not really. Like, what do they do when they're afraid? When they're afraid, they run. Right, or they might give a pata, like a, a kick with the foot. So what actually happens is that they they have their eggs buried under the sand. So they want to take care of them. They want to to turn them around. Oops. That's 
it. But um, we weren't talking about ostriches. Let's go back to the scientists. Do you think, uh, is, are you a scientist in the room? Is anybody a scientist in the room? Or a researcher? All oh, scientists, okay. <laughs> Do you think it's really frightening to, to face the consequences of your work? <laughs> Who thinks it's frightening? Shouldn't be. Okay. I would say it is, actually. The majority of the time, you realize that what you do as a scientist, actually, it doesn't matter to anybody. Right? <laughs> OK, great. <laughs> It does for myself, for example, like you learn, you learn a lot. But it can be tough, I think, when you realize like what you're putting all your emotion, your work in is actually, it, it, it's not, nobody really cares about what you do. But imagine what happens when you realize that what you do with all your heart and soul, it actually contributes to destruction. I think sometimes it's actually better to make abstraction from that. To make what? Abstraction from that. Not to, not to think about it. So one day, um, I was in, a, in, a, in California, in San Francisco. Um, and I went for a walk with uh, Ignacio Chapello. I don't know if you, if you know Ignacio. He's a, he's, a, he's a professor at Berkeley. And Berkeley is kind of, when I talk to non-academics, I would say it's a bit like Hollywood science, right? At least it's, it's a bit how, how I feel it also. And Ignacio is really, he's a cool guy and he has lots of stories. So he took me for a walk around the campus. Um, and on the beginning of the walk, he showed me a little like stream and a little bridge. He said like, look at that bridge, that's Phoebe. And Phoebe, Phoebe was the wife of the founder of the University of Berkeley. And what does the little stream do? It's like it separates the sciences from the humanities and, um, and the social sciences. And Phoebe is the bridge. So we continue walking. And after a while, he shows me a, a building. It's like it's a bit fenced off. And uh, so, yeah, there you see, you see that building? That's where the American military decorporate with the scientists from Berkeley. They have the joint programs. We continue the walk, and a bit further, he shows me another building. It didn't really look special to me, he said, Manhattan Project. Manhattan Project, he said, yeah. That's where Oppenheimer and his colleague, they developed the knowledge to produce the atomic bomb. And I remember, I tell you the story, because I remember the feeling it gave me was like, really, at that moment, it's like a cold shower. I, like, and all of a sudden, I could feel the connections between the knowledge that is produced within the universities and the wars that are like being fought all over the world. Because in my imagination, I went to Berkeley like with the idea Berkeley, Angela Davies, the civic rights, student movements, like kind of a, a progressive image. Is it? And then it would be easy to think that that's something that only happens in the United States, which is obviously not the case. Uh, I know more about Belgium than the UK, but I guess it's exactly the same here. Last few years, for example, in Belgium, uh, a lot of, of fuss has been made about uh, the University of Leuven, and it, that is participating, doesn't see a problem actually, in participating in a project that I would say legitimizes the tortures of Palestinians. So how it works, so the Belgium Federal Service of Justice, together with the university, they cooperate with the Israeli police in a project about inquiry techniques. So it m means that they make use of the experience of the Israeli police on inquiry uh, techniques for a research project. And in that way, Europe actually contributes to legitimizing the settler colonial project, right? In any case, I think the, re the reinforcement of the military it's like, it's actually, it's on the agenda of the, of the European Re Union, no? But, so they use research money to subsidize the, the military industry. And sometimes you could think this, this project, they lead maybe to, uh, to some technology that's useful for uh, warfare, 
gives a pike. <laughs> uh, but actually, usually, it's not the case. What, what these research uh, projects are important for, it's morely the, the public image, right? Or if you would cl stay closer to the, to the project, uh, imagine this potato is a genetically manipulated potato by the university. People would be like, ooh, like, uh, sorry, by Monsanto. People would be like, ooh, we don't want to eat that. Imagine we have another genetically manipulated potato that is done by university. Like, hmm, maybe there is something, uh, something in there, right? So that evening, we're talking uh, in the, in the, on this project in which the, the, the Belgium universities, they work together with the Israeli police. So we have a debate around that, and uh, one of a uh, friend asked the, the director of the university at that time, so even if Europe has on its agenda to subsidize the military uh, through research, could it be part of the university's societal mission? You know what the director said? He said, that's up to the researchers to decide. So he said it's an individual responsibility of the of the researchers to take these strategic decisions. I don't think the director really understands how the university works today. I guess you do. You can say again, I exaggerate, as I often do. But I think that to a large extent, the scientists today, they do research into the questions for which funding is available, right? If there is money available uh, for military research, there is quite a lot of researchers going there. If there is money available for developing genetically modified potato, that's what scientists do. So, okay, I, I'm sure I don't have to, to explain, uh, explain that here, but like, if you think about what you are, uh, how is your how is your performance measured today? It's called excellence, right? What do they measure? The number of publications in high ranked journals, the number of citations in the same high ranked uh, journals. The amount of money you bring in, probably, from different places. Maybe the patents, although that might be re much re less relevant here. And that makes it into the, the box of the quality of research, I would say. So if that's the context of today, and then say like that it's up to the individual responsibility of researchers to resist this race to the bottom, I don't think it worked. What it also means is that as a researcher, the less critical you are towards your funder or the, where the origins of your funding, actually the more chances you have to make, a, to make a career, to have a job, to have support, right? But let's go back to Berkeley for a moment. So the walk with, uh, with Ignacio, it ended uh, into the into the park of the life sciences. So Ignacio pointed me to a couple of buildings. It's like, so you see that building there? It's probably, it's there from the 80s. What's being done in there? They made GMOs. Then he points me to another building, a bit bigger, a bit newer. So that's the 90s, nanotechnology. And then he points to me to the, to the last uh, new building that's synthetic biology. So actually, by looking at like the extension of the buildings on the campus, Ignacio is able to see where are the, uh, the big challenges uh, of the futures, right? Remember? The potatoes uh, of the future. So in 2011, it's a while ago in the, in the meanwhile, with, uh, with about 400 other people, I participated in a direct action and that questioned the type of future that will be made with these GMO potatoes. The idea of the action was actually very simple. We were going to replace potatoes that were genetically manipulated to be 
better resistant against the, against the potato disease blight by organic potatoes, which is also a good resistance against this disease, right? So, sound logic. To give you an idea, I'm showing you a short video. It's subtitled. So during this action, I was one of the many spokespersons, and the goal of the action, I think, was was quite clear. No, like we wanted to turn something that was presented as purely technical question into a political one, um, and we wanted to create a political or a public a public debate on the future of agriculture instead and the role of public research uh, in there. It's like wanting to make a statement, an opinion. Uh, and the message we had, I think, that we were thinking that the that the public um, that the that the decision making public decision making bodies are orienting research public research into a way that's benefiting uh, profits rather than uh, society. And I must say, it worked quite well. Uh, actually, it overpassed us completely. All of a sudden, there is all these people that have an opinion about GMOs, that have an opinion about research and where the money should go, that have an opinion about biotechnology uh, in agriculture. So the next days, like a lot of um, of debates would happen in the newspaper. First, you saw the already the prime minister that had taken up his rubber, rubber boots to go to the to the site of disaster uh, and give his press release. Press release. Um, and people are also worried. So, like, the, I remember the, my telephone, a small Nokia at the time. It kept on, on ringing quite a lot. Hello, Barbara. Oh, these are my friends. Hi, Barbara. Um, 
Are you right? Yeah, it went really well. Actually, we're happy. Good. Another phone. Hello, Medwadba. Hi, this is the Morgan. It's the Flemish newspaper. Um, don't you see a problem in being a researcher and defending this kind of uh, actions? No, no, no. I, I think it's good for researchers to be involved in this kind of actions. Then a phone call, I don't think I will forget quickly. Hello, I'm Barbara. Hi, this is the vice rector of the University of Leuven. So that was my employer at the time. So he asked me, in your interest and the interest of the university, you have to present yourself on the rectorate tomorrow. Okay. So the next day, even we asked three researchers to be invited uh, at, the uh, at, the, at the university rectorate. Even though we are three, we are invited to come in one by one. You should imagine yourself, it's like this long wooden table. On the back there is like three uh, men in their 50s, like the rector, the vice uh, rector of research, and the personal affairs, something. So when it's my turn, I kind of, I think I, I, I put my two jacket, but I try to, to hide maybe a bit the bottom one. They asked me to take a seat. <coughs> and the first question is, if now three days later I'm calmed down, or if I still defy, uh, defend violence against science? Um, what? And I think that that was the moment when I start to explain the university directions that this was not an act of violence against science, but that they had to understand it as an action of civil disobedience. And that this action was actually necessary because the concern and opinion of so many people are not taken into account. We wanted to denounce this lack of democracy especially with regard to the commercial development and the commercialization of this new technology. Then the rector, I remember him saying, but you could have done something else, like make a petition, go with the banner next to the field. I said, like, yeah, we could, and we've done this. But actually, nobody would, would have noticed. Nobody would have listened to it. And that was exactly the issue that we wanted to bring up. So and now I think on that moment, probably I still had a lot of adrenaline <laughs> in, my, in my blood. So I start to get a bit excited and, and lecture the directors, who himself is a medical doctor, and his, uh, his um, <laughs> the vice director, who is a molecular biologist, about how they take decisions on GMOs in Belgium. So you should imagine, like whenever a decision has to be taken, whether you want to grow a GMO in the field, be it for research or for uh, commercial uh, activities, they get together this uh, Council of Biosafety. And in the Council of Biosafety, there is like a number of people seated. And they will give the advice to the minister, which then is going to take the decision. Right? And all the people sitting in this council, they are actually, they are either molecular biologists, they are from a, from a, from a very technical background. So they have a very good knowledge, but a very specific knowledge also. There's nobody sitting around that table who is concerned about uh, taking into account what social impacts, what's political, economic impacts, what's the, even from an ecosystem uh, perspective. Also within that, as a citizen, you are allowed to give your opinion. So you can fill out this form, but I don't know if you ever have, have looked at such a form, and I actually don't know what it looks like right now in the, in the UK. But in Belgium, there is like, you can actually give your opinion as a citizen on the technical issues, which is, doesn't really make sense. There's no, no space for you to, to, to write um, any other sorts uh, of concerns uh, in, in, the, in the form. And anyway, the forms you write, they are not really taken into concern. So I think the, the, fo the voices of the people that should be heard around these kind of questions, they are not heard. And well, I don't remember exactly, but remem th I think that's kind of what I was trying to explain, uh, explain the university directors. So what I was saying is like, 
you know, guys, like the future of fruit is too impor important to leave it in the hands of the experts alone, right? Result of that conversation, fired. So basically, what happened is that the, the university, they had to put me in front of a choice. And they say, wearing the two jackets, impossible. But you should ask yourself, like, why is it that after all, it's not such a spectacular action, it turned into such a big controversy, right? Imagine yourself, you have this field, it was as little as it had 108 GMO potatoes to be tested, 108 is like not very much, huh? The potatoes, they are developed through a public research institute, and there were four of the one of those eight, they were from the chemical company BISF. Around the fields, you had a fence, I think it's there, yeah. So you had a fence, uh, like this one, and then on top of the fence, you had like this barbed wire. The day of the action, you had like police all around uh, the field. You had cameras, like private guards, all that to keep the people that were actually interested at what was going on in the field at a distance, right? So the result was that I think this little potato field, it has definitely become the most famous one in Belgium, even it was such a very tiny field. And it's not that there is a lack of potato fields in Belgium. <laughs> no, actually, Belgium, it may be a small country But apparently, they're big in food, especially like French fries. So every year, you should Im imagine that 3.5 million tons of potatoes are in Belgium transformed into mashed potatoes and uh, frozen, uh, frozen French fries. And most of it go abroad. Actually, the, um, the UK, for example, I think it goes to 150 countries, and UK is the third biggest buyer of French fries, Belgian French fries. So Brexit is even affecting <laughs> the, the Belgian potato sector, uh, who are uh, afraid of the Brexit circus today. But also, you find these famous Belgian fries in countries like South Africa, Brazil, Colombia. And while in the last few years, like these countries are actually trying to protect their local markets by putting anti-dumping, uh, invoking <coughs> anti-dumping measures. So the industry is actually trying to expand this market. And we now have this guy. I don't know if you can see it. It's Mr. James Bint. So James Bint on the, on the image of James Bond. Bint is actually the famous uh, like variety of potatoes which is used to make uh, these potatoes. So what he's done, he's being sent to uh, Southeast Asia to make people that think that potatoes are not yet enough part of their uh, basic food to have them eat more potatoes, right? Just to say that in Belgium, it's a very small country, but still we have like loads of potato fields growing there even though like a lot of the transport potatoes are imported from France and, uh, and the Netherlands. Uh, but basically it's like, apart from uh, maybe maize and, and like uh, meadows, it's the biggest crop uh, in Belgium. So what does it mean that we also, together with the kind of mild, wet climate, we do produce a lot of blight of potato disease, right? And for that, um, we actually use also a lot of pesticides, right? So having having um, uh, sorry, I lost my thing. Oh, yeah. Okay. So if you go back now to the potatoes we were talking about, it, you have this country with a big industry of lot of potatoes, you have this problem of blight. So then the idea of transforming 
a potato to be more resistant against blight. Potato of the future, right? But if you want to understand even better, like why would the state in combination with the research, I think it's so important to mobilize what were like 60 policemen, which would be 108 potatoes. It's like one policeman for every two uh, potatoes. <laughs> it's actually understanding, you, you actually have to know that Belgium is not only proud of its potatoes, but also Flanders is proud of its biotechnology. It's like, it's like a trademark. And so we have uh, this center, uh, like a research institute in Flanders, which is called the Flemish Institute of Biotechnology. And the government, every year, they put like 63 million euros in the institute. It's a bit strategic center, like, like the Coventry uh, agroecology one, I would say. <laughs> 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 so the university, something similar, right? <laughs> Sorry? No, 63 million on the yearly basis. So that's the public money. But they don't get it for free, right? So to, to it comes with a contract. So what do the researchers have to do that work there? They obviously, they have to do research. They have to come up with all these uh, publications with, um, as we were saying earlier, attracting. They have to be good, good researchers, excellent research, actually. The Research Institute also, I don't know if that's like that here, for every euro of public money that's invested, they need to attract euros comes from elsewhere, right? What do they do for that? First of all, they go to the European Union. They ask a lot of ERC projects and this kind of thing. Then they do a lot of public-private partnerships with industry. And then on top of that, this institute, they also, they have the obligation to communicate with the public. So it's like this, this research institute, which is a developer of biotechnology, is also the one who is doing the communication with the larger public. They have to do communication with politicians. So basically they are paid for doing lobby. For example, right now they're doing lobby to deregulate uh, genetic <coughs> modifications on the European level. And they have to make money also. It's not only attracting investment, but making money by either taking a patent or by uh, setting up uh, startup uh, companies. So, for example, today, if you would w go for a walk in the, in the technology park near the University of, of Ghent, you actually have at the, at the center, literally at the center, you have the Flemish Institute of Biotechnology, which then is, over the years, it created a number of uh, startup com companies. So what's the idea of a startup company? You think you have a university. University, there is an idea that has a potential to become uh, commercialized. So you set up a small enterprise outside of the university, right? The idea of that small enterprise is that it will actually be eaten by a big enterprise and to then the money goes back to the university and the research. So in, in the case of the Flemish Institute of the Biotechnology, so in the 80s they sent off plant genetic systems which then was bought by Bayer, then they set an, up another one which was bought by BASF, then they bought set up another one which is bought by uh, Syngenta, which, which became Chansin. So basically, they, they were quite uh, successful from that perspective. And today you have what is called like a cluster uh, of, bio, of green biotechnology around the University of Ghent. So if you, if you think that, uh, so knowing this, seeing this panorama, I don't, this. So if you think from the perspective that the monetarization of knowledge, if that's really your aim, then I would say this is a big success, right? So Flanders is like, it has this cluster today. 
So the state money that was put into the center is in an efficient way turned into uh, private uh, property to this. So if you know this now, then it's actually quite easy to understand, I think, how, uh, why a partnership between the, the university, the state, and the industry has to put barriers and guards around, uh, around the field of GMO potatoes. They have a common interest in that. So if you see the, the Belgium as like potatoes, plus uh, the biotech center, this one, I think GMO potato, logical, the potato of the future. So if you now take out these four potatoes, which were for the company produced by uh, BASF, all the other potatoes in the, in the field, they were actually uh, produced in Wageningen. You know Wageningen? It's like, it's a bit the walala, I think, of, uh, of, uh, of agronomic research uh, uh, in Europe. So one day with um, some people, we went to a public day they organized around these famous uh, potatoes. So uh, the meeting, it was a moment in which we were going to talk about the virtues, virtues of these new uh, potatoes and how, thanks to them, we would have less economic losses due to the potato disease and especially farmers would have to use less pesticides, right? So this, the person who was leading the day, a specialist in participation, uh, as we all know, he took a bit the attitude, I would say, as, I understand potato of the future, it might scare you, but we have no choice. Otherwise, we have to use more pesticides. So that is the promoters of the, of the, of the, it means that the promoters of the potato of the future, they only saw two options. Either continue as we do, <coughs> having a lot of potatoes and using a lot of pesticides, either continue as we do, and we transform the potato to make more uh, resistance against the GMO. And that, it makes me, it's the kind of, uh, the kind of good deal that makes me think of what uh, Isabel Stenger, she's a Belgian uh, philosopher, she calls the in infernal alternatives. I will give you some, uh, some other examples. Of course we hear you, but we should make sure that we're not lagging behind. China is coming. Or of course, of course, we consider welfare is and, and health is very important, but in the meanwhile, the US they keep on advancing. Or yeah, yeah, possibly you're right, but you can't st stop progress. Uh, oh no, no, no! I'm not, I'm not a racist, but uh, we can't let all the migrants in. No, 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 we don't do it for our pleasure, but there are no alternatives. It's the economy, it's the market that tells us to do so. Bullshit. I don't think the market obliges us to do anything. I'm not sure if the US is really, a he really ahead. It's not that there are no alternatives. It's like, in many cases, there are plenty of alternatives. It's rather that we don't see them a, as a true alternative. We see them maybe as a small thing that can exist in the margins, but not as a true alternative. And we think, when we think about alternatives, we think about them and try to fit them in cages that we already have established. 
We refuse to be open to alternatives to be really something else. It's, and that's, I think, a kind of a trap. To pretend that freedom, for example, is being able to choose between two pre-established choices, two colors. I don't know if anybody knows this guy. <laughs> yeah, I've seen him. Anybody? <coughs> what would it be? <laughs> Sorry? Janus? Yeah. So it's a cat dog. So it, the cat dog, it's actually, it's the, I didn't invent that. It's like the, the Zapatistas in the, in the south of, uh, of Mexico, they do have, uh, they use that, that figure a lot. And the idea of the cat dog is that it's not a cat, it's not a dog, it's a cat dog, right? So the, the Zapatistas in their stories, they use this to open up imagination and actually to, to let go the usual modes of representation that we have around things. So with this fanatism of wanting to attack the potato disease, either with the dog of the pesticides or the cat of genetic engineering, it solves all the questions that are behind it. Right? In particular, thinking, do we really want to continue in an agricultural model that produces food to everyone and more, but that precisely does not succeed to feed the world? We are in a world where I think, what are the figures today? One out of nine go hungry while abundance exists. And do we want to continue to produce potatoes in Belgium to then export to Brazil and then import <laughs> soybeans from Brazil to feed the animals in, the, uh, in Belgium in the animal factories to produce meat that we then going to export to Russia and while doing so, on our way, destroy the means of production in Brazil, in Belgium, the soils, the people all over the world with the pesticides. So in, instead of continuing with this nonsense, maybe it should be time to think more in a cat dog way. So you remember that was in the, in the, in the public day of uh, promotion of these this potatoes in, in the Netherlands. I don't know if you ever tried these kind of interventions to open up the question, but I will bet you will be considered as a killjoy. It's like, it's indeed, actually, it's very annoying um, because these are the type of questions that you can't answer them. The only way to answer them is by changing registry completely. Right? So it's not about find, finding a point in the middle way or a great compromise uh, amid power relations as they exist, I would say. No, it's, it's to imagine something else. But then we speak like squarely of another economic system, of another, of another world, I would say. And it's not that people don't do it. Like, for example, Bajta Kachdes, I don't know if people are familiar with her. She's a great activist, I think, and she was unfortunately murdered. It's a shame that the So 
So what she's doing there, I think, is extending the field of possibilities. And that's something which is really needed uh, when we think today about what to do in the future that's not very encouraging, I would say. But that's something that's probably best understood by those who have all interest in nothing to change. Because what would happen if people start to believe that it's not necessary to accept things as they are? It puts actually in, in, it puts in danger those who benefit mostly, right? So thinking back now, it's not so weird that the Belgian uh, state, they accused the potato activist of belonging to a criminal gang. So we were like criminalized, criminalized and that was needed as a way to avoid that people would get IDs. So it was needed to show to the potential investors in uh, uh, the biotech companies in Flanders that Flanders is a region where you can safely uh, invest. So after the action, on a, we had to go to, to court. And some of us uh, like risked the prisons for criminal conspiracy, also very <laughs> appropriate in the UK today, I guess. Um, but these trials, they were actually quite heartwarming, I would say. There was always lots of people that show up. They, uh, despite snow or rain, they would be there to discuss and to exchange on alternatives. Yeah. The trial was also a kind of a, a lengthy process. So when it was finally our turn to explain these judges why we had participated in the big potato swap, as we called it, it was like a well-mature wine that was being served. There was a young farmer, uh, a father of a newborn who had been fighting pesticides for a long time, a bike fixer, uh, a circus, uh, circus teacher that had seen the consequences of uh, GMOs in Paraguay with his own eyes. That's like really sincere. And when it was finally my turn, I mainly talked about my studies as a bioengineer. So I'm a daughter of, a, of two engineers. And as like an okay student with uh, rather idealistic. So bioengineer, it seemed like mm, that's possibly a good choice. So I told the, the, the judge that I started the university with, with actually big ideals. I thought that with my studies, I would be able to contribute to sustainable development. So I actually believed it. So I was ready to spend five years in the Faculty of Bioengineers, which is pretty hard work, a lot of mathematics, physics, all sorts of geometry. Uh, and while, of course, many agronomists coming out there they do beautiful work. Mm. I would rather like to attract your attention to the, the ideology that's prevailing in, uh, in these uh, this faculties. I don't know, are there bioengineers, engineers in the room? Agronomists, maybe? Yeah, some of them. So I would say that the ideology of the, that's reigning there is that the, the capacity to, to develop, to give people the, the capacity of people to solve all kinds of problems, climate change, feeding the world, waste, uh, through technical solutions, right, technophys. So to enable us, the students entering in the university, to do that, um, our brains had to be formatted, I would say. So what you have to become able, you have to become able to think uh, all what lives in a kind of mechanistical way. So it's not only physics, mathematics, but what you also do uh, is like, you, you remember this dissection sets? Usually I bring it, but it's not allowed on the Eurostar. But like what you do basically is that you you learn about life by cutting up open dead uh, dead animals. Um, we also uh, by doing that, little by little, I think we were getting ready to understand that we would also be able to create a life. So we basically learned how. Scientific facts, they do exist separate from the context in which the knowledge is produced. In a time span of five years, this is how I see it now, we were transformed in experts with a certain confidence in lifting problems out of their context 
study them without listening too carefully to the first place to people that aren't concerned by it, but trust on our own skills to define the problems and come up with the solutions. At least that's how, how, I, uh, how I experience it. But what I also learned during this court case is actually that my mom, she used to be a big GMO and, uh, activist 20 years ago. And she was a member of parliament when I was in university doing my studies. And one of the files she followed at that time uh, were the GMOs, uh, moratorium existed at that time. And with a colleague, she did a, a regulatory proposal in which they wanted to have representative from civil society in the Biosafety Council. The same question we were still uh, explaining 20 years later. And at some point, my mom asked me what I thought about GMOs when I was still in, in, in the school. You, you know what I answered? I said, well, but, uh, mom, but that depends, no? So I, I can't remember. I, I was really interested in GMOs during my studies. But I remember the fact that there was this story of uh, GMO bacteria, which would be able to clean up the, the oil spills in the seas. You remember when the boat is like doing big oil spills, so the, the bacteria would be able to clean up the spills. So I thought that would be a, a actually an interesting idea. So even if I know, if I knew at that time that we had to leave the fuel fossil uh, economy behind us, it didn't look like a bad solution. So I was not able to see the connections between the transport of uh, fossil fuels from one side to the other of the world, economic interest, and the development of the GMO. In my head, they were all separate issues. And the, um, there is a famous parable uh, that exists that's saying that quite well. It's about the, the, the elephant and, uh, and the blind man. I don't know, I, you know, Basically, what's happening is that there is six blind men living in a, in a village. And one day, there is an elephant passing through the village. And they've never seen or felt an elephant before. So, they, um, so even though they can't see it, they decided, let's go and feel it. And they went down to the, the, vi the village to touch the elephant. The first one who was feeling his leg said, Hey, the elephant is actually a pillar. No, 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 said the second one. It's a rope. He was holding the tail. Mm -mm. It's like a thick branch of a tree, said the third man who was touching the trunk. Mm, it's like a big hand fan, said the fourth man, feeling here. No, it's like a huge wall, sounded the fifth who broke the belly. Mm, no, it's rather a solid pipe said the sixth man with the saskin in his hand. So they all they enter up into a heated uh, argument about who was right in describing the big breath. All of them sticking to their own perceptions. While the man, uh, the a wise man calmly said, each of one of you is correct and each of one of you is wrong. An elephant is just an elephant. And I think something is similar is happening in the universities. So we organize education, research, uh, de departments, journals, education, all by scientific disciplines, mathematics, urban sociology, agronomy, and so on and so forth. And we lock up the knowledges within these different disciplines, which makes that as scientists, we are pretty well trained to, to go into depth, but also that we see things a bit in trenches. So we see the world in a, in a particular way and only ask the questions that our disciplines allow us for. For example, in biology, you're not supposed to ask questions about well, the origins of the finance uh, of your research and its consequences. So as a consequence, so I think while we are very good in this developing the specialized knowledge, but what is really bad, I don't know here, organized in the university is a conversation between these different uh, disciplines. So we get trapped in a sort of tunnel vision, I would say.
try to get out of that. The one million question. You remember the matrix? The magic, the, pool, the blue pill? That would be great, eh? but I'm not sure I believe in it. In any case, giving answers is not really, really much my thing. I prefer the questions, actually. So the question would be rather, who has, defining, who has the power today to define the questions? How are the research problems defined? Who is deciding on the methods being used? In whose interest? You remember the ostrich I started with? So there were lots of other animals uh, that day. There was a, a flamingo. He didn't really know what led to dancing. Monkeys, more. So the idea of that was, it was an attempt, I think, to think together. And for everybody to communicate from their perspective what they see. Um, as uh, Sarso Santos uh, Bonaventura said, Brazilian researcher, if you want to go out or we want to get out of the monocultures in the fields, probably we, we should start to resist the mono knowledge monocultures. And these would start with the voices that are absent uh, today in the existing knowledge mon monocultures. I think it also requires to, to stop granting authority um, at the science role of preaching, preaching and seeing science as something that's constructed by people. So some days I think, I believe, um, I want to continue to work in the sciences, sciences that sustain life, sciences that oppress, uh, that oppose oppression, destruction. And those days I try to imagine like how could we actually reclaim the sciences? Like from a grassroots level, armed with incomplete questions. Through action research, through transdisciplinarity and so on. Other days I wonder. And I think maybe we should rather think of burning the universities. But even when I think that, I don't think I'm anti-science or anti-technologies. But I, I don't think we need to save it, neither. It's more thinking of how to continue to deepen it, but liberate it from anti-democratic, authoritarian uh, forms of capture. So that's why I think, after all, it's important to remove uh, these barriers and to continue explore and to enter into a discussion uh, about uh, collective practices. It's knowledge building. Facilitate conversations between knowledges and experiences. And here I can't do anything more than stop. And it's time to have a conversation together. I've spoken way too much. And think more like, I don't know, hacker spaces, wine connoisseurs, passionate of something, like they get together around something that is like of collective interest to them and they look at it from their different perspective and with their different interests and try to have a, a conversation <laughs> around it. And before going, actually the cat dog also received results in other projects. I don't think it's we have to choose between researchers being a researcher or being an activist. We can just be something else. 